Welcome to everybody who's joining us tonight. Um, let me just pull up my little screen share here so you guys can see my presentation and we'll get started. All right, so um, the topic obviously for tonight is regarding dentistry and how it relates to the equine athlete. So um, some of you I see that are attending tonight are clients of mine. Um, you guys know firsthand that um, it's very difficult for me to keep dentistry to an abbreviated topic. So I'll do my best. We don't have um, as much time as I'd love to spend talking about it, but um, my goal tonight will be to give you guys a little different perspective and hopefully a better appreciation as to why dentistry is important, especially for our equine athletes. Let me see if I can find that. There we go. All right, so just a really quick bit about myself. Um, I attended veterinary school at the University of Minnesota. I completed an internship in equine practice at the Wisconsin Equine Clinic and Hospital. I completed a residency in equine practice at the University of Minnesota, and I joined West Metro um, back in 2008. So um, just a little bit more specifically about my training, I'm a boarded um, species specialist through the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. Um, so rather than um, specialize in a particular facet of equine medicine, I'm, I'm specialized in that um, I have specialized training to work specifically on horses. So my practice generally is limited to horses or, or equine species. Um, I, I originally passed my board certification in 2010, recertified in 2019. And of course, I'm here tonight talking to you because I have a special interest specifically in equine dentistry. So part of the um, kind of emphasis for tonight, part of our title was talking about the equine athlete. So to me, any horse, regardless of what they're doing or the level they're doing it at, they're all equine athletes. So, you know, even that horse that's just doing, um, you know, short rides, going out trail riding, they're, they're still working. They're still working and they're, um, you know, needing to perform up to your expectations as the owner and the rider. So dentistry is a really integral part of keeping any horse that's in a training program or performance program healthy and performing well. Um, so that, that's really our goal. Um, we don't wanna forget that we're not just focusing on dentistry because we want the horse to be able to perform. Oral health for the horse is also a really important link to their overall health. So being able to bring in their feed materials, break the food, food stuffs down and utilize their diet and their nutrients um, is also important for their overall health as well as their muscling and condition again. Um, to develop athletic potential. So there's a lot of questions that you guys submitted and that you may have afterwards. Um, any specifics that pertain to your horse in particular, um, I'd recommend questions pertaining to, you know, what does my horse need? When do they need it? Um, those are really best addressed one-on-one -on -one with your veterinarian um, who uh, generally treats your horse and or provides dental care. But um, just to make some just general recommendations and kind of explain why, um, I'll, I'll kind of cover just, again, very kind of general recommendations. Every horse is an individual, so I can't cover everything that every horse out there will need. But a general recommendation of, of a probably minimum annual oral exam is, is what I recommend for most, most clients. So um, the components of the oral exam are also really important, and they may vary a little bit between different practitioners, but generally speaking, um, most veterinarians are going to provide um, some degree of sedation to keep the horse comfortable and keep things safe. Um, we're going to use some kind of speculum or device to open their mouth, as well as lighting so that we can properly visualize um, everything that's going on in the horse's oral cavity. We're gonna complete a, a full exam of the oral cavity, teeth, tongues, um, everything, not just the teeth. So uh, we'll, we'll dive into what might be included there and what things look like um, as we get farther tonight. So, and then while we do our exam, we're gonna chart and document any 
any of our findings. So whether things are normal or abnormal, um, we want to make sure we record that and communicate it with you as the owner. So just to give you a quick overview of everything we want to cover tonight, I'm going to do my best to keep it brief, but I, wa I want to make sure that um, I've covered some of the important terminology um, and anatomy that you'll need to know um, so that we can look at um, some of the more detailed topics as I move on. Um, I'll talk a little bit about kind of the basic principles. Again, very basic, just to make sure we've got time to cover as much as possible tonight. Um, so basic principles of routine dentistry and how that relates to movements of the horse's head and jaw while they're chewing as well as while they're working. And then you guys get to play along a little bit as well. So once I explain everything um, to you, I'm gonna show you guys some examples, some photos, case photos and videos. And, and you guys can see what we would see as a veterinarian. So what, what do we see? And then what are we doing or, or what are we aiming to accomplish when we're doing dentistry or so-called you know, floating of the horse's teeth? And then if we've got a horse that is having some performance issues, um, how, do, how do we start to figure out what to do to help them? So to dive into our anatomy and terminology, um, dental tissues in the horse are, for better or worse, fairly complicated. So it really requires in-depth knowledge of the structures that we're working on to be able to assess them well. Um, so in order to kind of determine what's normal or abnormal, we have to have a good understanding of what's going on in the mouth, what's appropriate for the horse depending on their age um, and phase in life, and then again, assess more than just the teeth. We've got to look at the oral cavity. We've got to look at the outside of the horse's skull and face um, and determine you know, what's normal and abnormal and, and pinpoint any concerns or anything that needs to be addressed. So um, we'll, we'll go through some examples, like I said, and let you guys kind of play along a little bit. And I'll try to give you some good examples of what the horse's mouth generally looks like before dentistry is performed, as well as what it might look like afterwards. Because that part is a little bit hard I, as much as I love dentistry and I love to share, it, it isn't always a really great spectator sport. We can't all see what's going on while it's going on. So this is my opportunity to share with you guys a little bit through photos and video um, what we're actually trying to accomplish and, and what we're doing where. So again, this talk is just to give you guys a better perspective on equine dentistry. It's really complex. So we can't quite cover it all in the hour that we have tonight. So I'll do my best to cover as much as I can. So just to review um, the types of teeth that horse have, um, some of these would be similar or equivalent to humans or small animals, and some things about horse's teeth are a little bit different. So um, for starters, hopefully if I move my mouse, you guys can see it. So I'll use that as my pointer tonight. Um, so starting at the very front of the horse's mouth are the front row of teeth or incisors. So horses have six upper and six lower incisors, generally speaking. Um, then going um, kind of down the row, the next that we may find are canines. And those are generally only present in our male horses. Mares may or may not have them. They're generally smaller and more variably present in mares, but so they may have between zero and four canines normally. Um, moving farther back in the mouth, um, some horses may have wolf teeth. So usually there'll be one or two or none. Um, and if your horse doesn't currently have wolf teeth, it may be that they never had any, or it may be that those were extracted when the horse was young and just starting training. And then all the way back, um, which we'll take closer look at tonight, are what I'll kind of refer to commonly as cheek teeth. So those are our premolars and molars, um, and they, those are the teeth that basically kind of do the grinding and, and chewing of foodstuffs. All right, so just like when you go to the dentist and the hygienist does the exam and charts everything, um, your dental findings are recorded um, with a specific number that corresponds to a particular tooth. Same is true in the horse. And we, we kind of have a, a very similar adapted scheme for identifying each and every tooth in the horse's mouth. So basically if um, where I'm sitting, I'm standing facing the horse, and we're looking at this diagram here on the screen, there's a little imaginary dotted line that starts right at midline 
um, right down the center. And that's our starting point. So the very first tooth to the left or the right of that imaginary line is the O1. So again, going back to our little diagram I just showed you, the very front teeth are the incisors. So those are indicated by the numbers one, two, and three. Our canines, if present, are the number fours. Wolf teeth, if present, are number fives. And then our premolars are number six, seven, eight, and then molars nine, 10, 11. So again, starting at our O1s, that's the very front of the mouth at midline, moving all the way back to the farthest tooth in the back of the mouth is the 11. And then the prefix for these, how we identify which side of the horse's head, right or left, upper or lower, um, is indicated by the prefix here. So upper right quadrant, those all start with one, upper left quadrant start with a two, lower left quadrant with three, and lower right four. Hopefully you're all still with me. Um, so just to, to really quickly highlight um, some of the um, notable timeframes in the horse's development. So from birth to one month, there are some um, teeth that are erupting in our foal. Um, so, so a common question I will get from owners is, when should we start paying attention to teeth and dentistry in the horse? And my answer is usually basically once they're born. It doesn't mean that, that a foal needs the same kind of dental care or attention maybe that an older horse does, but there's, there's a lot going on. And um, if you can kind of look down this chart here, again, between birth and just a few years of age, there's a lot of teeth that are coming and um, deciduous caps or baby, baby teeth that are being um, expelled. So during this kind of dynamic time frame, um, if, if there's any, um, anything that disrupts the normal pattern of teeth coming and baby teeth coming out, um, we can run into trouble. So it, it is worth keeping um, as close an eye on some of our younger horses as it is our older horses. Just some quick um, terms that I may mention tonight uh, for your reference. Um, if I mention um, cementum, dentin, and enamel, those are three of our dental materials that make up the horse's teeth. So similar to what um, components are making up our teeth, they're just layered and structured in a different fashion than human teeth. So um, as you can imagine, horse's teeth and their kind of jaw strength uh, withstands a lot more force than ours. So they do have to be made up a little bit differently. So, um, so cementum um, is one of our strength layers of the tooth. Dentin uh, makes up quite a bit of the uh, equine tooth material and is, is useful in covering our pulp horns, which we'll talk about. Um, and enamel is a really strong material. So it adds strength and grinding power to our teeth. Um, if I mention occlusion or occlusal surface, I'm mostly just referencing the chewing surface of teeth. So that might be the sort of contact surface or, or grasping surface of their incisors, or that might be the grinding surface of their cheek teeth. The apex or the root is, is sort of the bottom of the tooth, and that's the portion that we'll find anchored in bone. Uh, and the crown is the top of the tooth, or what you'll see when we look in the horse's mouth. So just to look at kind of an up-close view of a um, upper or maxillary cheek tooth in the horse, it's, it's a bit complex and it's a little bit hard to um, assess what's what. So I've, I've gone ahead and um, maybe poorly so, but colored in this um, diagram for you, just so that it's a little bit more obvious which dental structures lie where. So here's your little key up on the right. So our peripheral cementum or the cementum that is overlying the outer portions of the tooth is in gold. Our infundibular cementum is yellow. Um, so I'll explain what the um, infundibulae are, but they're basically this, these kind of little half moon structures. Um, they're surrounded uh, by enamel, which is indicated in red. And again, enamel is our strongest layer and it's the, the key um, structure that helps the horse grind their foodstuffs. So this kind of scrolling pattern and sort of redundancy um, across the horse's tooth surface 
serves a great purpose. It, it's why they're able to grind hay and grass um, and, and an important part of their digestive process. Dentin in light blue will kind of cover some of the um, recessed areas on the chewing surface. And then the dark blue is where the pulp horns are. And we'll talk about those a little bit more. So our pulp horns, similar to the structures in our teeth or dogs and cats, um, it contains the vital structures of the tooth. So there's blood vessels, nerves, sensitive tissues. Um, unlike other species, uh, horses have many more pulp horns per tooth oftentimes. So this little schematic on the right is a diagram of the, the numbers and locations of pulp horns um, on their cheek teeth. Not that there's going to be a quiz at the end or that you guys have to memorize this, but what I want you to, to realize, again, is just the, the complexity of a horse's tooth. If we see a particular issue on our oral exam, it's important for us as veterinarians to, to know um, what's normal or abnormal. And if we have perhaps a dental fracture across a particular area, we need to be able to assess um, properly if any of these vital structures are involved, because that will help us determine our uh, treatment plan. So why this is important to you as horse owners, um, these areas can be somewhat vulnerable to damage. So we, we are able certainly to do our dental procedures safely, but in, in many instances, if we have a large overgrowth, we may caution you that we can't always um, kind of correct things back to a more normal state in just one visit. We have to do it gradually and we have to do it safely and it's so that we can protect these sensitive areas on the horse's tooth. Um, Basically overlying those sensitive tissues, again, as I mentioned, there's a somewhat protective layer of, of dentin. And if we take a bunch of tooth surface off, we shorten that layer of dentin. Um, and, and because we want to, again, keep, keep a safe distance from those sensitive tissues, we just don't wanna go beyond a certain depth. So if we do have to take some of this dental tissue down, um, it will just take us a few months time to kind of replace what was taken away. And again, sometimes we have to do that um, to correct an abnormality, um, but there's a reason behind, you know, what we do and how much we can do at any given time. All right, so there's a whole smattering of pictures here and I include it just to show you guys different views, different teeth. So starting over here on our left, um, this, this specimen is a nice up close of the pulp horns. So again, depending on um, how darkly pigmented they are, they may be somewhat easy to see or they may be somewhat challenging as in this specimen. So here's one, here's another, here's another, here and here. So um, that's this example here. Um, in the central portion or central photo, um, this was a horse that had um, some aggressive uh, reduction done on this first premolar here. And so as you can see, even though these are somewhat faint, you're easily able to make out where the structures are. Um, over here, it's a little bit more unclear and that's due to having an excessive amount of dental tissue taken down. It, it kind of makes things a little bit blurry. We're not able to uh, identify where our pulp horns are. Um, this photo down on the right is an example of um, a significant dental abnormality, what we call a, a dental hook. And so you can see the front portion of this tooth is significantly longer than the, the back portion of it. So this would be something that we'd want to um, try to address on our during our dental procedure. But if we look up close, um, you can see this little dark dot. And if we compare that to the other photos, it corresponds to this very front pulp horn. Um, so that would be why we have to be um, somewhat conservative about how quickly we might reduce that um, abnormality just so that we don't overdo it and um, cause any pain or sensitivity for the horse. The incisors and up here as well, the canines also have um, pulp. So for those reasons as well, we don't want to um, aggressively um, reduce the height of our incisors or canines if it's not indicated. So I, I'm just gonna show you with the cursor here. Here's our pulp horn on that tooth. Here's that one. Um, so that little kind of central circle is where the pulp horn is on those incisors. Um, and then up here on our canine, um, 
This canine unfortunately um, sustained some damage somewhere along the line, um, and it's got some kind of darkness or decay as a result. And that's probably due to um, a previous insult where the um, pulp horn was uh, damaged. All right, so other structures on the tooth surface that are notable um, are these little things I kind of already talked about. So an in infundibula or infundibulae is the plural form. Um, basically, it is this little kind of notch or little indentation in the chewing surface of the horse's tooth. So basically it, it's made up of two portions. It's kind of got an enamel ridge around the outside and it's, it's filled with dental material called cementum on the inside. Um, and the horse's upper or maxillary cheek teeth have these additional structures, but their mandibular or lower cheek teeth do not. And so one thought behind that is just to make the, um, shape that the maxillary cheek teeth have is a little bit wider than the lower cheek teeth and it increases their surface area or their grinding power. Um, that seems very uh, reasonable to me. So um, I, I, that's usually how I explain it. But regardless, um, these, these structures um, can be of importance in horse's teeth as the, as the age. So not necessarily that the horse is older, but as the horse's teeth um, move through their own lifespan, um, they can undergo some changes. So again, a common question that, that clients will ask me, do horses get cavities? So the short answer is sort of. So horses generally don't get cavities in the conventional sense, um, like we get cavities or you know, dogs or cats could get cavities. Um, they do, however, um, sustain some changes to these infundibulae as they age. And it, it basically kind of mimics the process of a cavity. So it's not a true cavity, but as you can see where I'm outlining um, with the cursor here, there's certainly a darkened area of decay um, that's isolated to this um, portion of the tooth. Um, so it will progress and, and sort of behave somewhat similar to a cavity. Um, and then the photo on the right is a horse that now has um, a similar process affecting both the, the front and the rear infundibulae of this tooth. So um, why that becomes a problem is once we get a certain uh, portion of the surface area of the tooth that's affected and is decaying, um, it sub can substantially weaken the tooth strength. And those horses um, with, with a tooth or teeth like this um, can be at risk of having that tooth fracture. So um, that's just something that we like to be able to kind of document and track on our annual exams. All right, so um, another question that we'll often address is why do horses need routine dentistry? So one reason um, that, that we uh, will highlight is they get sharp points. Um, and, and why they do is a little bit kind of due to their unique tooth structure. So one structure that we find along the cheek side of their upper uh, premolars and molars is something called a cingulate. These are basically ridges down the side of the upper cheek teeth. And those kind of run down and turn into sharp enamel points. So our little blue arrows are those ridges. Our big red arrows are where our enamel points are. And then, then again, over on the right here, we're just highlighting where the sharp enamel points lie. Um, it's not to say that we don't have sharp enamel points on our lower cheek teeth. Those will also happen. Um, and, and those will generally be found on the tongue side of the lower cheek teeth. So when, when do horses need dentistry? I already kind of talked about this a little bit, but young horses, uh, again, when they're erupting caps, they may have wolf teeth. There's a lot going on in their mouth um, at the, that point in their life stage. So prior to training is usually a good time to have a veterinarian check um, and as well as kind of checking annually just to make sure everything's on track. Some young horses I found can get sharp points relatively quickly. And especially while they're in training, this can cause them to be more reactive or sensitive to things. So um, I'm always in favor of young horses getting checked frequently just to make sure that there's no cause for concern. Older horses, um, we do want to make sure we also monitor for anything painful. Um, so oftentimes that will be somewhere in the neighborhood of six to 12 months. 
Um, so they're more likely to have loose or fractured teeth, feed packing, gum disease. Um, I'm gonna to touch briefly on something that we'll talk about a little bit more later on, but um, big long title of a condition um, that's shortened to an acronym EOTRH, but that is short for equine odontoclastic tooth resorption and hypersomentosis. And it's a really painful condition that can happen to horses as they age. We'll come back to that. And I'll definitely talk about that more, but anyone in between, my, my very general recommendation, again, every horse is an individual, but somewhere between six and 12 months is generally recommended. The, the tricky thing about horses is that their teeth are constantly erupting. So they'll generally have several millimeters of, of growth of their tooth per year. And so along with that eruption and growth, those sharp points will generally develop. So in our performance horses, common reasons why um, owners will call veterinarians um, for assessment would be things such as head tossing, grinding the bit between their teeth, maybe they're leaning on one rein or they're sort of heavier in one direction. They may be reactive or resistant when asked to flex at their pole or set their head. Um, and we don't wanna fight with them. We always wanna kind of take a pause and make sure that there's nothing painful or nothing that, that needs to be addressed. Because if we keep kind of pushing beyond a certain point, um, especially if the horse tends to get their tongue over the bit, um, if they react violently, it could cause some bony injury to their bars. So one difficult thing um, for, for us as veterinarians is if, we, if we're concerned there could be a dental issue, um, ruling in or out causes from their mouth versus other causes. So our oral exam findings might explain what, what you as the owner are noting. Um, if we find some sharp points or dental abnormalities, we're gonna work to gradually address these. It's tempting to say, let's just fix everything really quickly in one visit, but you know the immediate reward is not necessarily worth the risk to the tooth um, down the road. So gradually is generally better. Um, and, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, horses learn by feedback. So sometimes when they've had something that's been painful and we start to address it, they can continue to have some behavioral um, changes uh, until we can kind of work them through those things. And, and, and that can make diagnosing the cause a little bit difficult. So usually we'll start with an oral exam routine dentistry, that helps a lot of the horses that are displaying those behaviors. But in the instances where it doesn't, um, we can move down the list to some more advanced options. So just to remind myself to, to share with you all, um, again, when we're doing our oral exam, um, we want to be as thorough and detailed as possible. We're going to look at their teeth, of course, but we don't want to discount or miss anything that's happening in their oral cavity. So here are just a couple of examples of lesions um, that can happen to horses. Some of these um, happen from, from sharp points, certainly. Some of these can happen from plant materials. This one kind of looks like um, a common lesion that they'll, if they've got um, foxtail or other um, prickly plants in their hay. Um, and any sharp points can cause oral ulceration. So those will generally heal somewhat quickly once we've resolved those. Um, but this, this photo on the left um, is kind of what you'll see as the veterinarian standing in front of the horse. Um, if you're just looking, you're not using your instrumentation yet. Um, so it can be a little bit daunting. Um, there's lots of surfaces, there's lots of areas. So there's lots to see and observe. So once we've done our oral exam and we're gonna move on to our routine dentistry, um, there, there's several goals that we'll try to accomplish. So this, this slide makes it sound like it's all really very simple and um, there's not very many steps, but I'm including a lot in this slide. This is kind of like my sort of dental philosophy is kind of in a nutshell here. So um, we're gonna aim to smooth our sharp enamel points on our cheek tooth surfaces. So those are generally our buccal or cheek surface our lingual or tongue surface. Um, and that's what we generally refer to as occlusal adjustment. So that basically that's our process of routine dentistry. We're smoothing all those sharp points. Um, while we're doing that, we're also going to round and kind of smooth around the front edges of the first cheek tooth. So that's the one, remember, that we um, refer to as our O6s. Um, so there's terminology that's kind of persisted um, in, the in the equine dental world, and that's something called a bit seat. Um, that's just referring to the very sort of front edge of that first cheek tooth. Um, 
but it, it is important for me to note that the bit actually shouldn't contact that area. Um, there's there's been plenty of research um, with uh, basically advanced imaging with a horse in a bridle, um, and we we can successfully confirm that the bit shouldn't be moving backwards. Um, so we still have this area kind of known as the bit seat, but um, again, the, the bit shouldn't be that far back in the horse's mouth. So, um, so generally, if there are not any significant dental abnormalities on their chewing or occlusal surface, we won't take any dental tissue off of those areas. Um, if we find hooks or ramps or steps, um, which I'll show you examples of, um, we're only going to work on reducing that specific tooth surface. So only the ones that are affected that have um, too, too much um, height to the tooth. And most often, again, I can't make generalizations for, for every horse everywhere, but most often we don't do a lot of reduction of incisors unless there's a particular issue. And then we will kind of just smooth the edges of our canines and make sure they're not sharp, but we don't want to generally reduce their height or grind them down um, because like all the rest of our teeth, they, they contain pulp or sensitive tissues. So the way that, that I do this for horses and, and a lot of practitioners that you'll see, um, we'll use a combination of motorized equipment as well as hand equipment. And the specifics of what gets used or how it gets used is a little bit different, but hopefully mostly the, the you know, outcome is kind of the same. I have a picture up here on the right of just some of the like up close of the um, grinding surfaces of these are motorized um, and these are hand floats. And that's what I will typically use for, for most of my cases. Um, so again, just kind of doing the routine exam and, and dental procedure helps quite a lot of the horses that we see that have some of these um, performance issues. And it just by making them more comfortable. So again, just to reiterate, we're gonna smooth the sharp enamel points. If there's any sort of abnormalities um, as far as the height or size or shape of teeth, we can address those. Um, and, and so this really right here should have a big star next to it, that by making those sharp points smooth, um, we can avoid having their, their cheek tissue get pulled into contact with the bit. So if you have an English performance horse that's got um, a nose band, um, that would be very common for a horse to be reactive if they've got sharp points on these surfaces and, and they have a you know, nose band or a piece of tack that kind of helps compress that area. Um, the, things could get pinched if, if we don't correct those and, and kind of enhance their comfort. And again, we want to be conservative. So just really quickly to kind of show you what those, those general um, procedures might look like. Here's an example of our first cheek tooth here from the side. Um, this is our before and there's just, it's the horse isn't exceptionally sharp, but they've got a nice edge there. Here's our after. So um, this area, again, as I mentioned, the very front edge of our first cheek teeth, upper and lower, is what's referred to as the bit seat. And so really what that entails is just a nice kind of gentle rounding of these areas. Um, what we don't want to do is add a really big sloping contour for two reasons. One, if I draw an imaginary line here where our pulp horn should be on the front of the tooth, we've basically removed most of the tooth overlying that, that sensitive area. So that could be quite painful for the horse. And then the other reason we've, we, again, with our some of our advanced imaging, we're able to determine that um, our cheek mucosa can actually get pulled in if we've got too big of a, a slope here. So, so just some images again, um, so that we can we can all kind of appreciate together what what's going on um, in the horse's mouth. Uh, looking at these these anatomical specimens here, you can see along the edge very sharp enamel points where my cursor is going. And then again, just using these examples because it's much easier for us to visualize together if we're looking at the horse from the side. Um, this is a great example of just nice, smooth kind of rounding of those sharp edges. 
Um, viewed from above, again, we don't want to completely remove all of the contours of the side of the horse's tooth because those serve an important purpose as far as moving their food bolus. Um, as they chew, they need to be able to move it from the front of the mouth all the way back. So these little ridges along the, the side of their cheek actually help them auger the food from the front to the back of their mouth. And then again, on the tongue side of our lower cheek teeth, we'll also smooth any sharp points. All right, just a bit about how their jaw normally moves. Um, they, they're basically kind of moving in a sliding figure eight motion. So part of our uh, exam involves kind of assessing the horse's side to side and front to back motion. Um, we can kind of mimic their chewing motion. Um, and then similar, but um, you know, in a performance perspective, horses in the bridle are going to need some front to back movement of their jaw if we're asking them for pull flexion and collection. So our little schematic up here kind of shows you the path that the horse's jaw takes. And then I included some up close um, images of, of what phases of the chew stroke looks like because the horse's teeth are not um, engaged when the horse is at rest. So just like us, if we relax, our jaw will kind of um, not be in contact, the upper and lower jaw, similar for the horse. So here's kind of phases where the horse's teeth are not in contact. And then as they kind of move across, you can see their incisors come apart, their cheek teeth are coming together, um, just as this diagram indicates. So again, why that's important in the performance horse, if we have large, um, sharp dental abnormalities, it's going to restrict the movement of our jaw in one or more directions. So this is why um, making sure we address this pathology is really important. And generally, if we keep the horse on an annual schedule, because they can only erupt a few millimeters per year, if we're doing regular exams, we can try to stay ahead of the development of such significant abnormalities. So here's a really big step here. Um, and a really big step here. And you could definitely appreciate um, that this would not only impede their ability to chew and move their jaw while being um, worked, but it might also cause some kind of localized trauma and inflammation. All right, so just up close is here, some examples of some hooks on our upper sixes. This horse has a decent hook, um, as well as a pretty sharp enamel point on our lower 11. Um, and then down here on our right, um, some examples of ramps. This is, an, this is the back of the horse's mouth on an 11. This is the front of the horse's mouth on a lower six. All right, so as we're working with the horse, um, I borrowed these um, images from a website, standledressage.net, but they just do a great job of showing that as we ask the horse for um, more pole flexion or being on the bit, um, they're going to move their neck and pull in such a way um, that it's going to change their head position. And that's where our horse's jaw needs to be able to move freely as well. If we have those dental abnormalities, that would impede the horse's ability. Um, and it, just to kind of show a side-by-side -side example, this horse here is being asked for some nice um, pull flexion and, and contact with the bit. If they had a large dental abnormality um, at the back of their mouth or somewhere along their uh, chewing surface, it wouldn't be very likely that they'd be so accepting. This horse is a nice, relaxed um, expression, and they seem to be very accepting of what's going on. So, so really quickly, we're going to look at some photos and videos and see if you guys can um, appreciate some of the uh, things I've just show, showed you. So um, here is a photo of a horse's mouth. Um, so looking down their chewing surfaces, it may be a little bit hard to see as we look farther back, but again, this is kind of the perspective we have when we're standing in front of your horse, we've got the all the gear on and we're looking in their mouth. Um, this is what we see. So this horse, I don't know if you can appreciate, if you can see, but this horse has a small fracture and he's missing a small portion of this tooth. Um, so we can appreciate that as well as on the right or the left side of the mouth, excuse me, um, we can see there's, there's kind of a like, step or a little overgrowth or a ridge right there. So hopefully if you're playing along, you guys correctly identified that. All right, our next photo, I apologize, is just a little bit dark, but some sometimes it's like that, um, looking in the horse's mouth. Um, hopefully you'll notice presence of uh, wolf teeth. There's one on the right side of the horse. Here's one on the left, pretty sizable one. And this horse has a sizable hook on their upper six.
another view here. I didn't, if it was me that rinsed this horse's mouth, I've got quite a bit of uh, grass and stuff still in the horse's mouth. So I probably want to rinse it again, but things that you can obviously see, there's a pretty sharp um, hook on the front of this upper six. And then if we look way down into the horse's mouth, hopefully you can all appreciate there is an uh, upward overgrowth here, what we term a step. All right, so next, hopefully I won't make anybody motion sick, but using our oral endoscope, um, I've got some images or some videos for you guys to, to look at really quickly here. Sorry, sometimes it takes a little bit to get focused. So I'm just gonna pause this one really quickly for you, but this is our upper left cheek tooth. And hopefully you can appreciate, there's a pretty sharp point right there um, that isn't always typical, um, but you can see along this horse's cheek, um, there's a significant ulceration there. So it's really important for us to, to note that that um, is causing that ulceration. So we can make sure we address that. Then as we move farther back, hopefully again along the edge of this horse's cheek, you can see there's a pretty big point and that corresponds to some sizable oral ulcers. Right, I'm gonna go to the next one. Um, so this is uh, one of my patients. We're just gonna look at the left side of his mouth before dentistry really quickly so you can appreciate the oral exam findings. And then I'll show you that after. I know these move really quickly, but again, um, it's, it's a very realistic kind of snapshot of what we get to see. So it is pretty cool though when we take videos um, that we can slow it down and we can go back. And actually I'm gonna go back for one really quick second because I do wanna get to some questions from you guys, but um, I don't know if anybody playing along at home caught that little ulcer at the back of the horse's mouth, but without um, good sedation, um, and good diagnostic equipment, you might miss that. And as it's moving through, hopefully you guys can appreciate our infundibulae and our, here's our pulp horns, which look very normal and healthy. All right, let me find, oh, sorry. Um, that one didn't have the, the after. All right, one more quick one before dentistry and then I'll show you a quick one after, but. So that's the upper left and we'll do a quick flip and we'll look at the lower left and then I'll show you guys the after. Did you notice the fracture right there? There's a small piece of tooth missing. All right. So really quickly show you guys the after. Sometimes our um, camera lens gets a little bit of debris on it, so I apologize. And it moves pretty fast, but you can see how um, those enamel points along those edges are quite a bit smoother. Let me go back to the beginning of that one really quickly. So there's no longer such sharp edges along that surface. So, all right. So really quickly, um, if, if our routine work doesn't solve the problem, we may have to consider other diagnostics. So, you know, we, we wanna make sure that the bit bridle, all the tack fits appropriately. Um, sometimes we move on to, to more uh, advanced diagnostics. So nerve blocks sometimes can help us isolate things, 
x-rays um, or even something like a head CT. So um, just quick examples of digital x-rays or radiography, we can get um, views of their incisors or their cheek teeth in the field or in the hospital. Um, and why x-rays in the field are really important. I mentioned this long um, acronym condition. Again, painful dental condition affecting incisors or canines. And it's something I'm seeing more and more in our performance forces as a subtle um, cause of changes to their behaviors. Um, so our diagnosis is really based on exam findings. And then we support it by taking x-rays. And if we end up doing surgical extractions of any affected teeth, um, then we can confirm that with, with histopathology. So all these images are just examples. Um, this is what the condition might look like on x-rays. And you can see there's quite a bit of destruction of dental tissue. Um, sometimes we move on to um, something like a head CT. So computed tomography or CT is a 3D cross-sectional imaging. Um, we are able to do these standing now. So here's an example of a horse um, at our equine center who's undergoing a head CT. And you can see the horse is standing. They're, they're sleepy, they're sedated, but they don't have to undergo general anesthesia. So this has been really great for us. If we've got a performance horse that's doing something that we can't explain on the oral exam. So um, one example um, would be a horse that has significant disease in their TMJ joint. And so I would just wanna share with you really quickly so we can get to some questions. Um, but this is, this is an example of a head CT of a horse that ended up um, being di diagnosed with arthritis of their TMJ joint. So we won't stop to kind of pinpoint everything, but I just want you guys to see how um, amazing the detail is. So this is a scan. Um, we're going through the horse's head from front to back. So you can see the sinuses and their cheek teeth as it progresses through. Oh, there's their front teeth. All right, so dentistry, um, again, it, I could talk about it for weeks and weeks, but um, I, I know I'm not the only one who feels that dentistry is really important consideration for all horses, especially those in performance training. Um, depending on what your vet advises, usually horses would benefit from a dental exam every six to 12 months. And, and the goal would be to keep the horse's mouth balanced and try to address issues really quickly, as well as let you as the owner know of anything that would pose a problem. Um, equine dental structure and function is a very complex topic. It's really hard to cover in a short amount of time. So um, knowing that um, dental issues can sometimes have an obvious cause, or they may require us to do a more thorough workup to, to help you determine what, what's causing a problem. And then again, our advanced diagnostics can be really helpful as well. So with that in mind, we'll stop and I'll try to answer some of your questions. Thanks so much, Sarah. That was really a good presentation. Um, you kind of answered part of this first question already, but it is what are the signs and symptoms that horse owners can look for that indicate that dental work is needed? And how often should a horse's teeth be floated? Yeah. Um, well, again, some of the horses may show signs and symptoms uh, that, I, that I listed in, in the PowerPoint. So it may be something like as simple as um, the horse is suddenly losing weight or you're noticing them having issues eating, or it may be something as complex as some behavior um, that they're doing while you're trying to ride them. So really anything that you are concerned about or you might think is causing the horse pain that could be attributed to their teeth, that's a great time to chat with your veterinarian and consider having them evaluated. And again, without knowing specifics about individual horses, it's really hard to advise, but most horses um, would, would greatly benefit from at least a minimum of an annual exam. Um, I, I, in my experience, there's very few horses that don't have some sharp enamel points after 12 plus months. So keeping ahead of those and making sure that there's no other issues going on can give you a lot of peace of mind as a horse owner. Thank you. Uh, another question is, why do some horses, regardless of age, appear to have a dirtier looking, have dirtier looking teeth than others? Um, the 
person that sent in the question says, we have several horses we know who all have routine dental care and good nutritional care who have different looking teeth. One of the younger ones that's age six has darker teeth than the, that look dirtier than the 20 year old horse. That's a great question. And some of you might've noticed in my various photos and videos that there were horses teeth and like one horse's tongue is quite darkly pigmented. Um, so I think that's probably similar to what, what this um, individual is asking about. And horses' teeth are somewhat porous. The dental materials um, can end up taking up pigment from things in their environment. So the hay or grass that they're eating and the minerals in the soil, um, just like us, some, some teeth will stain differently than others. So it's generally, uh, unless a horse's tooth is becoming dark and discolored because of a disease process, if it's kind of generalized and it's, it's through the horse's whole mouth, it's probably just due to staining and it's probably not harmful. So they probably need crest white strips or something, right? Right. I, there's, you know, don't get me started on how few good, uh, oral healthcare products we have for horses. I feel like that's, that's something that we need to, to work harder at as a profession, but. Anyway, um, uh, another question. Do horses have different classes of malocclusion, such as prognathic mandibles? That sounds like a DVM question. <laughs> it does. Um, so just, just to, to speak to everybody out there, the question is pertaining to malocclusions. Um, and, and so, yes, they, they absolutely do. So if there's somebody out there that's in the human or other uh, maybe small animal dental field, yes, they, they do. So what that's referring to is um, horses can have jaw length disparities um, relatively frequently. So horses may have an overbite or an underbite. Um, and, and generally, unless it's something that's really pronounced, it's not, it's not a big issue as far as their day-to-day -day life. Like prognosis for life and athletic ability is, is great. Um, but uh, there, there can be some instances where that's problematic. Um, and I know that one of the other um, questions that somebody had mentioned was when, when um, some of those kinds of abnormalities are present, are they genetic? So that's where I would say that, that um, does make uh, some of those malocclusions or overbite, underbite, problematic. Um, in some instances, yes, they, they definitely can be genetic and um, may not be a desirable trait um, in show horses. So okay, thank you. that answers their question. <laughs> uh, when a lower molar is removed, will the other teeth move into that space? Um, sometimes. So <laughs> yes and no. So if we do extract a horse's tooth, um, it fairly frequently, the other teeth will kind of drift together and fill in that space. Um, but I would say the more important point, um, to sort of add, um, to this question is, um, we don't always know if teeth will drift together and sort of fill in that space. So it's really important. So I hope whoever submitted that question was able to attend tonight. Um, because if you've got a horse that has a tooth that's missing um, or was extracted, those horses especially need to have minimum of annual oral exams because otherwise if they're missing a tooth, that's a really common place where some of those um, dental abnormalities can develop. Um, so always being proactive and preventative will save you a lot in the long run. If we can keep those from developing, um, then they're annual dental care won't be quite as intense. Makes sense. Is it, a, is it common to have mild discomfort for a couple of days after having um, the teeth floated? That may be true, um, especially if you have a horse that has um, arthritis. If they might have some arthritis in their um, TMJ, it's, it's possible. Um, but I, I think for, for most horses, if it's somewhat routine and it's abbreviated procedure, it shouldn't be something that's exceptionally painful. Okay. Well, there's another question that kind of fits in there is how do you diagnose and treat TMJ and how does it affect the body? That can be complicated as this owner might know. So, um, with our addition of, um, 
a standing head CT, I would say locally it's it's becoming a lot easier. So not to get too far into the complexities of the TMJ joint in the horse, but um, it can be a complicated diagnosis because it can look like a lot of other things. So some horses that might present with something that um, we might presume to be a dental problem, we may rule out things in the horse's mouth and we may move on to ruling in or out TMJ disease. Um, what makes it complicated is that the TMJ joint um, is made up of a lot of different types of tissue. So there's bone, there's cartilage, um, it's a joint space, so there's joint fluid. Um, and so in order to best kind of assess the area and determine if, if it's painful, it can be a multi-step process. So something like x-ray can be helpful, but that will show us bony changes. Something like ultrasound can be helpful. That will show us soft tissue um, issues. When possible, doing a head CT um, can be super helpful because that's one um, diagnostic modality where we can look at all of the different tissues together. So um, for cases uh, that, that have had head CTs, it does seem like that has been um, a big game changer as far as confirming a suspected case uh, that has TMJ disease. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like we have time for one more question. Do you, re do you recommend an equine vet with a special training in dentistry versus a general equine vet for performance horses? I think that, um, I mean, it, it depends very much on the individual. I can't speak for all veterinarians out there, but there's lots of really, really great veterinarians who might do things other than just dentistry that really have a passion for it and are really interested in it and can do a great job. So um, I think you can certainly, you know, if you've got an individual that um, you're interested in working with, you can chat with them and make sure that it's something that they are um, comfortable helping you with. But um, really for me, the way that I'm going to address my patient isn't going to be different if it's a pasture pet versus a performance horse. The horse needs to be functional and comfortable. As I kind of explained, the, the mechanics for them to chew comfortably are very similar to the mechanics that they're going to need to move their jaw in performance situations. So there, there isn't something drastically different in my um, personal opinion um, as far as how I do dentistry on those horses. The considerations and the, the timing of how frequently I see them might be different, but the overall procedure should be fairly similar because we want all of our horses to be comfortable and healthy, so. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we'd, like, we'd like to say thank you, Sarah, for your, Dr. Weefel, for your time, um, presentation and insights this evening. And thank you to our many participants that shared thoughtful questions in advance during the presentation. Our West Metro uh, Equine Practice Ambulatory Clinic is located in Long Lake and is there for the care of your horse. So please don't hesitate to reach out. As always, the Piper Equine Hospital is here for you 24 seven. We look forward to seeing you at the next BMC Animal Health Education Series virtual event. If you enjoy the learning and information provided tonight, we encourage you to visit our website at www.equine.umn.edu or, re or feel free to reach out to us directly. And lastly, we hope you will consider supporting our equine program, whether your gift is for clinical outreach service, education of the next generation of equine practitioners, or towards the advancement of equine research, its impact makes a difference in the lives of horses and the next generation of equine practitioners. Thank you again for attending our equine webinar presented by Dr. Sarah Weefel. Please stay well and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everybody.